like I started to see everyone talking about AI. And even though my soul is the poet by the pond with a typewriter, I had to be like, I have to just get on board with this. And if not, it will leave me behind and I can just be like the old man on the porch yelling at people and bitter about it. But I soon had to find my space in it. Well, hi there and welcome. I'm Joan Posity, host of the Side Hustle Hero podcast, the show that is laser focused to inspire you to start or to scale your side hustle income streams. Today's guest has indeed found her space in this AI world. Like a lot of people, Gabrielle Gerbis was understandably freaked out about what the proliferation of AI would mean to her business as a freelance writer and copy editor, and her business did drop off. But then she decided to jump on board and figure out how this could work to her benefit. Her business then grew. Her agency now brings in around $15,000 a month in revenue. And while she is paying out subcontractors, her business expenses are low, particularly given her lifestyle as a digital nomad. I spoke to her after she had just arrived in Thailand. In addition to hearing how she started her freelancing side hustle, scaled it and pivoted to profit in this age of AI, you'll also hear about some unexpected benefits of life as a digital nomad. It sounds to me like she's found her tribe. But before all that, I have a favor to ask. If you're enjoying what you're hearing in this podcast, I'd be so grateful if you would take a moment and leave a five-star review at the platform where you're listening to let others know that there's valuable content here to help them start or grow their side hustle. Thank you so much. Now here is my conversation with copywriter, editor, and brand strategist, Gabrielle Gerbis. Welcome, Gabrielle. Thank you. Thank you. Glad to be here. Well, when you were introduced to me, actually, you were described as a digital nomad copy editor who splits her working time between Thailand and LA. Well, give us a bit of a background on your side hustle journey and how that led to this enviable lifestyle you now have. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll sort of rewind the clocks back five, six, seven years. I don't even know. Seven years, really, when I was in college. And if you knew me in college, you would have never thought that I would be the corporate type. I was a creative writing major. I loved to travel. I spent my summers backpacking, not interning. And I really thought I would be some sort of poet or academic. And that all changed when I took an entrepreneurship class my senior year. And I sort of was introduced to this concept of, whoa, business owners, people who are doing their own thing, they're Mm. so inherently creative that it's kind of a way to both be creative, tell a story, you know, because businesses, brands, they're just stories. Yes. And I sort of fell in love with that angle of, okay, well, I'm a creative writer, but there's so many different ways to use writing in the world. And I don't think my teachers and professors prepared me for that. It was like, You could either go into academia, get a PhD and teach, really just teach or try to publish. So to anyone's surprise, I sort of just ended up in a marketing-based role fresh out of college. I think it's because I didn't know what else to do. I was working as a content strategist, as a brand manager. Okay. But I started as a content manager, as a brand strategist for a a company. And I was fresh out of college because I hadn't interned or really thought much about my career. I either was faced with, hey, do I want to just waitress, which I had been doing and go live with my parents? Or, you know, I had a great opportunity to work for a tech company. I went to a great school. I had a really great resume and I was a a strong writer. So do I want to just work at this corporation, make a pretty decent salary for someone right out of college and just like figure it out from there. Right. But I soon realized that's the trap a lot of people get into is they just say, okay, well, I'll figure it out. And then 10, 20, 30, 40 years go by. And I could sort of see that in front of me, a long road ahead with people in the office, just they didn't like what they were doing. They didn't care about it. They were living for the weekends. They were saving up all their vacation days, which in the United States is absolutely pitiful what you get. Especially in the beginning of your career too. And then you see these yeah. people around going you're like, only 14 more years before retirement. <laughs> exactly, exactly. And I was commuting too from LA to Orange County, which if any of your listeners are familiar at all with LA, that is like a death sentence. I felt so unhappy just with that, with three hours a day in the car. And 
<laughs> I soon realized that, okay, well, the, I could see how quickly life can pass you by in this environment. Luckily, because it was a startup environment, I was exposed to a wide range of different tasks in the branding and marketing space. Now, I was super miserable pretty soon into it. And there were some issues just going on with the company. It wasn't a nice place to work. And I started to just look for jobs because that's all I knew at the time sure. was that if I'm not working here, I have to work somewhere else. And my other dreams of travel and being creative, those don't really count because I can't really manifest them in a way that allows me to be an adult and to provide for myself. Yeah. And so I, I would wake up at 5 a.m., go to Phil's Coffee in Orange County and send in a bunch of job applications through Indeed and LinkedIn. And then I would go work at this job and I would come home sad and, and apply for more jobs. And I realized like with how impersonal the job search market is, like I know yeah. everything has gone tech. I'm sure they, because it's so easy to send in a resume, they were getting probably hundreds of resumes a day. And I was someone who, like I said, I went to a top 25 US university. I had a great resume, good grades, dean's list, and I wouldn't hear back from anybody, not a single person. It was the most soul-sucking few months where I'm like, how could I even get out of this job if I wanted to? Because I can't even line up something else and there's nothing really wrong what I'm bringing to the table. Yeah. It was at that time that I had heard about Fiverr and I had only heard about graphic design sense where I never thought that being a writer, being a brand strategist and editor, which were, I'd say my three core talents, okay. I never thought that that could be a freelance thing at my age. You know, I was um, 23, 24. I thought, okay, well, this is kind of, I didn't know the difference between a freelancer and a consultant. And I thought that to be a consultant, I needed decades of experience. I needed a right. whole Rolodex of clients. And I had only worked for one company with, apart from my years as a student editing grad school publications and whatnot. Right. So I had a person that I knew did freelance graphic design. And I thought, okay, well, that that's one thing. But it was actually my boyfriend at the time, now husband, who would hear me complain all the time. And he's like, just put up a Fiverr profile. That's what he had told me. He's like, what do you have to lose? Just put your freelance profile on the internet and see what happens. And I, had, right. I knew about Fiverr and that was really all I knew. So I did that and I just put it up there, sort of started to look because this is what Fiverr has you do. I sort of to look at my skills as how can I commodify these in, in a mm. deliverable package where people don't have to hire me by the hour, or by the salary. Right. They can just pay me to provide a service. And with my skill set, I could already think of like three or four gigs. And I remember like my first order. I didn't think it was going to work. I was super skeptical, I think, because I was just in a negative place. And then within two months, actually, I had replaced my corporate salary and quit my job. Whoa. Um, with, yeah. Wait a second. Within two months? Two months. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> what, what was that first gig? The first gig was, and it's still one of my best selling gigs to this day, was um, building your brand message and elevator pitch. So, towards the end of my corporate job, I was really in the branding space. I realized how bad branding, bad brand messaging specifically, could create a company that I worked for, which is a company who didn't know who they were. Right. So, I used my storytelling background to how can I help you talk about yourself as a story? Mm -hmm. And now that gig, I think it starts at $100, but it was like $15, $10 at the time. And I literally like, I cried when I just made that first, I think it was $12 after the Fiverr commission. You're like, I did, I, I did it, I did it, I did it. And I spent probably so long on it, but I didn't really ca care about my hourly breakdown at that point. I, I just wanted to do it. I just wanted to be able to make the customer happy. And they came back for more work. And I think it it told the platform that I was good and people rated me well. And so I was able to deliver what I said I was going to do. And I think that just worked to my benefit of bringing more people in to explore my services. And I can see you not being too worried about the hourly rate back then because you want to develop your portfolio and your reviews and just your own workflow and getting customer feedback as you're going along. Absolutely. And I had a professor who was absolutely life-changing, brutal honesty with me. And he's like, the worst thing that you can do is just quit your job with no backup plan. I'm sure some people would disagree. 
But he's like, that gets demoralizing really quickly when every day your day is just, did I hear back? Did I get an email? Did I get an interview? So that's why I think I was able to work really hard and focus on the quality of the work because I still had my corporate salary and I'd be in the car on my lunch breaks, talking to clients. I'd be working at night and I worked really hard, especially at the beginning, but I would recommend that to any new entrepreneur or freelancers. You have to be okay with working hard and it will feel that much better in the end. I think there's a lot of misinformation out there of just like, don't worry, overnight success, you got this. And I don't know what that's like, but it feels really good when you do put in the work and especially at the beginning without caring about the money. How long was it before you did get your first gig? I think it was just a matter of weeks. I want to say two to three weeks, I got my first gig and they trickled in pretty slowly at the beginning. But I think that the first person that worked with me immediately worked with me again. And I think that helped feed into the analytics of the platform or the algorithm or whatever they use. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So it took about, about two to three weeks. And I think part of what helped me is I was able to make the case for myself because I'm a writer. So write, you know, really killer bio, just like a why work with me sort of thing. Mm -hmm. Right. And to be able to um, showcase samples. Yeah. That first client and the momentum of the beginning really unlocks a lot of excitement in you. So at the beginning, I was not only working with clients, but if I didn't have a client, I got really into following other entrepreneurs and listening to them. I got really into marketing. So I think when you are in a corporate environment, you give up the reins in so many ways of like, I have this job security. I know that there's corporate training. I'll learn this way. But when it's on your own, you realize that your success is directly related to not only your talent, but your mindset your work ethic, things like that. So I became really obsessed with how can I learn more about this world? Because it was so new to me. I I really didn't think that I would have been able to do it without a decade of corporate experience under my belt. So in that two months, while I didn't have a steady stream of work, I was learning, reading, and just doing a lot of extra development into how I can perfect my skills Mm -hmm. and deliver a better service. That uh, ongoing training is so important, whether you're working for a company, but especially when you're working for yourself. And I kind of shake my head sometimes when I hear people say, well, I'll take this particular course if my employer pays for it. Mm -hmm. I'm thinking, man, that should just be bonus. If there's a a seminar or course or book, whatever it is that you feel is going to help you, then jump for it, pay for it. And if your employer wants to reimburse you all of it or percentage of it, consider that a bonus. But what you learn is yours forever. You take that and apply it to certainly the corporate life, but oftentimes in personal life as well, whether it's about interpersonal communication or time management or stress management or whatever it is, right? And I think we drop so much money on on Amazon Prime and Starbucks and things like that, (laughs) where if you actually look at the trade-off, like there's no teacher, we're not in school anymore. And I'm I'm a lifelong student. I loved school. I I would have gone to school for the rest of my life if I could. But I think it really becomes up to you to self-educate as an adult. And it's worth the investment. I totally agree with that. And that's, if I may say so, part of the reason for your early success in doing that is that willingness and desire actually to continue to improve. So what are you offering now as a freelancer? What services do you do? Yeah, so a little bit about Back at that time, I started to see a need for more work for my clients where people enjoyed working with me and they'd immediately ask like, oh, I'm building a brand. So do you have logo services? Do you build websites? Do you do, you did the brand messaging? Do you do website writing? Do you do ongoing marketing? And I had an early mentor tell me, again, I say the advice I was given, not knowing if it would work in other situations. So take it with a grain of salt. But he said to just say yes to everything and figure it out. And if you can't figure it out, then hire someone else to figure it out for you, even if you're operating at a deficit. So if I say like, yes, I can do X, Y, and Z, and I have to just pay someone else to do it, I'm not taking any profit or even a negative profit, then at least it's a learning experience. So I soon realized that a lot of people out there needed design. They needed that next step from brand messaging, be it a website design 
and social or marketing content. Right. And I soon in brought in my cousin who was just a few years younger than me. She was in university, a top design school. And I just said, Hey, can I just have you on board? Can I pay you to help my clients make logos and and make designs if they need to? And of course she's like 18, 19 in college. You think you'd only work like a coffee shop job to make money. And she's like, absolutely. So we got an early client who was working with like a venture backed startup company. So lots of money and funding, lots of really brilliant minds behind it. And they needed a more robust visual identity. So I started to scale that way by instead of working myself ragged because I did, but I can't clone myself. So I thought, okay, well, there's only so much capacity I have. And at the beginning, I really didn't trust anyone else to do the writing, to do the storytelling, because I just thought, I'm here because of how I conceptualize things so that it's too early to outsource my IP. So I brought in her as a designer. I About six months in, I brought in a website developer and we started combining our services. So that was really early on of just full service branding capabilities from let's name your brand, let's think about it, let's tell its story, let's get the visual identity and let's get the website. So that again, if we're talking about self-education, it helped me learn about these other offerings that I didn't have the skill set, but I could work with the people that who did. And so often a mentor is a piece of that that I hear from yeah. <laughs> successful people, from our side hustle heroes. There's someone came along who's been where you've been and have given you that advice that is just so valuable. Do you do websites? Do you do? Um, sure, of course I do. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> I'll look after that for you. And to be honest, it really, it never turned out horribly. Like I definitely got into some situations where I overestimated or maybe I lost money on the project, mm-hmm. but it never turned out too terribly. And I think that was such good advice. It, you're your own greatest critic unless you've done all the self-development work and, and you're a rock star. But at the time, I, I did have doubts about what I could do and how I could scale. So to just have someone, if it's yourself, that's great. But to have someone be like, say yes, figure it out later. Yes, you can do it. You're smart. You'll figure it out. Yeah. I think that's super valuable <laughs> advice. It's like a... Yeah, especially at that time when that mentor clearly had the ability to see more in you than you can see mm-hmm. in yourself. So he or she gave you that push that you needed to step up and say yes. Absolutely. And I find in life we have our successes and we have our learning experiences. Mm. So either it went really well, everything was perfect, or you know there were aspects of it that were probably fine. And in the future, here's what I would do differently. And I had a, a mentor, a friend who was in the construction industry. And there was one time when he lost, it was close to 100,000 on a deal. And wow. he said, you know what, Joan? But I'm glad that happened at the time because there was so much that he learned from that. And as he went on to get bigger jobs now into the seven figures, he's like, my eyes are open now and I know how to deal with that. So now I'm not losing seven figures. That's so smart. Yeah, absolutely. I love that. It's not success and failure, but success and learning experience. That's definitely something I I try to do all the time because I still have them, (laughs) the learning experiences. Well, and as you're growing your freelancing business, there's a point where it's been all you and now you're contracting out the web design and other aspects of it. How was that for you being able to give up some of that control and I guess, trust others, the people on your team? So I always thought that I wanted to be a boss just because I'm a natural leader. I'm like, I want to be the boss and then the corporate world will take too long to get there. I soon realized that managing people is such an art and I have so much much respect for really great managers Mm -hmm. because people who can lead people and inspire people and manage them, it's amazing. I I don't know if I'm that person. I like to think I'm okay, but it is really an an art and a talent. And it, it was a bit difficult at first, but it wasn't as bad as I thought because it was opposite skill sets. So I knew that I couldn't do the job better than them and I had to trust them. Right. For me, the important thing was keeping the experience cohesive for the customer. So being able to, even if I wasn't super involved in the logo, to really get in the trenches and understand what my designer was doing, what the client wanted, and to be able to be that intermediary that could communicate. But I know from every book I've ever read, you have to delegate. I think I overworked myself so much at the beginning that I knew that 
if I didn't want this to be like a one to two year stint, and then I ended up completely burnt out and back in an office, then I had to trust and kind of trial by fire again and and learn the hard way if needed. Well, let's talk about copy editing and AI. Because I've heard quite a few copy editors are freaking out about becoming redundant and obsolete with the rapid invasiveness, if I can call it that, of AI taking over. (laughs) What's been your experience? Yeah, uh, this is my favorite topic. So when AI first entered the equation, I think to the masses last November, I had known about not ChatGPT, but I had understood and worked with other AI tools such as Jasper. But I had always thought that writing is a profession that will never go out of style. You always need writers. You always need people who are good with the written word. And I was totally wrong as soon as I saw how well these tools worked. I definitely saw a change in sales for sure. But, you know, there's the economies down, inflation. It was hard to attribute what what was going on. But when AI entered the equation, I start, I freaked out a bit too. I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to ride my wave as long as I can. And yeah. if now's the time for me to be done, then I'm done and I'll like start an e-commerce business or I'll, I'll use the entrepreneur skills I've learned to do something else. But that was a little preemptive in, in terms of my, <laughs> I'll just stop. It's, it's just my time. Because I soon realized... It's been a fun ride, but you know. (laughs) (laughs) I'm like, okay, well, my my husband can just work harder and I'll I'll figure out how to make ends meet another way. Right. But no, I I realized that was a bit bit preemptive of me because AI is... I don't think AI is is a destination. It's a tool. It's now just like Grammarly or any tool. Obviously, that's kind of an understatement because it does a lot more. But I soon realized that clients would start to write stuff in AI. And then there's a limitation on these tools as well. So I assume I I think Fiverr is kind of my playground for testing ideas because it's so easy to put up a gig especially when you have the traffic that my profile already has, I can put up a gig, see if people like it and get the benefit of being a a high seller on there. And so I started in back in, I think December, I put up an AI editing gig of like, okay, so people are writing AI content. They probably need an editor because if they're not good writers to begin with, they they need that human touch on the content if they want to publish it. So Once you recognize that AI is coming and it it could put you out of a job, I think one of the the keys here that excites me is that you didn't leave it at that and say, oh, poor me. There was at a point where you said to yourself in some way, shape or form, how can I benefit from this? How can I work with this? How can I grow my business in spite of this or or along, along with this? I had to have that moment with myself because I started to see marketing from Fiverr about AI. I started to see everyone talking about AI. And even though my soul is the poet by the pond with a typewriter, I had to be like, I have to just get on board with this. And if not, it will leave me behind and I can just be like the old man on the porch yelling at people and bitter about it. But I soon had to find my space in it. So I'm like, I can still use, you know, entrepreneurs and business owners, they're still busy. They still don't have time for things. AI is probably shortening their time, their process, but it's not the end all be all. So it can write for you, but it can't think for you yet. I say that yet because we don't have chips in our brain. But I had to find my space and I had to own my space in that. So I think I got in on the new AI gigs on Fiverr early again. I think I put it up at the right time and I have a Fiverr representative because I'm part of their Seller Plus program. And they recommended to me like, yep, we don't know what we're doing with AI, but it's here. So it's going to happen. It's going to be a thing. And I just had to realize like, I have to get on board. Yeah. So I think that now it's like the internet or a smartphone. It's one of those huge changes where there's going to be people that just make a ton of money, fame, and just by being involved at the beginning or finding ways to integrate it with things. So I had to find a way to integrate it with my business offerings. Right. So you added that as a business offering. And so what has been the response? 
Yeah. So I soon realized that many people were using AI and that's probably why my sales were down, but they didn't know what to do with it after. So they'd be like, Hey, I'm, you know, I'm a busy entrepreneur. I want to write an ebook. It's now easier than ever to use AI to write an ebook, but I don't know if this sounds like me. It sounds pretty robotic. It sounds really repetitive because when you do use AI to write like ebook and things like that, it's unfortunately, the output is so generic. Yeah. Like I advise my client, hey, if you're a thought leader, if you have a lot of followers, if you're like a micro influencer, don't put your name on this unless you've gone through it extensively or hired an editor because it's just filler content. And I think because of how our algorithms work, we're so used to like filler content, filler blogs. You Google like something and then you get that top hit and it's usually just filler content. It feels like not of value. Mm -hmm. And I was worried that my clients would start to pump out content in mass that did not have value or their own personality to it. So that's where I wanted to come in and help. And as far as those entrepreneur businesses too, my understanding is that Google penalizes content that it deems AI generated. Yeah. So that was the second wave. I think at okay. first, like in December, people just thought, hey, this sounds robotic. I need to humanize it. But now, okay. yeah, that is the thing is I use tools that rank the content. And if it's 100% AI written, I don't think that's good. It's supposed to flag that in Google. So now if if a client comes with a blog, a website, et cetera, I come in to edit it and to make it human. And the irony is, is that I charge double for AI editing than I do for other editing because sometimes I have to basically rewrite entire sections. And I get frustrated really? when I do it because I'm like, this isn't, this isn't good. Like how, why are you thinking about putting your name on this? So I think that for anyone out there who wants to use AI, I think it's a great supplement, but you can't let that make you lazy. Right. <laughs> you have, <laughs> you have to either do the work to edit it or to put your own spin on it or hire someone who can do that for you if you're busy. So I've gotten so much success through that gig. Um, even without orders, I get about a quarter million impressions per month on that gig, 250,000. Yeah. So even if obviously not that many people are ordering, but it just goes to show that that is what people are thinking about. That is what people are talking are about. Numbers, and yeah. it, it feels good. Yeah. It feels good mm -hmm. to be part of the conversation, especially for someone like me, where I've always been anti-tech. I've always been <laughs> like the the poet in the woods sort of person. So <laughs> fighting well, against my nature. <laughs> you mentioned there's websites that you can go to, to drop the text in and it'll tell you how much it thinks it's AI generated or not. Yeah. Yeah. So there are some, some are free. Like I think G zero GPT or there's like that one's a free one. I use originality.ai, which is a paid service. You have to pay for credits per word, but that's supposed to be the most advanced one out there. It can give a lot of false positives, which is annoying. Like I'll write and rewrite an entire paragraph of content and will still flag it. I'm like, I just wrote that. But yeah, the, I'd say that that's the best that we have right now. And that's the best we can do. So until these tools evolve, we just have to make do with what we have. And it's probably going to be touch and go for a little bit. But I guess you've tested it enough, like a, a before and after the text the client gives you, you run it through this website yeah. and then you do your thing on it. And then do you do that diagnostic again? Yeah, I send them a before and after screenshot. So it will, oh, wow. I think people have, people have a little bit of high expectations of they can give you something that is 100% AI generated and you'll somehow bring the percentage down to zero, but it doesn't work like that. Even if I rewrote, I'd have to rewrite the whole thing and it would still probably say some of it's AI written, but I'll normally take something that's 80 to 100% AI written. That's what it's ranking and bring it back to them saying only 10 to 15% is AI written. So it will go from mostly red to mostly green. And that's sort of my verification of that service, which is why I charge more for right. it because it takes time and it takes really massaging the content sometimes. It would almost be better off if, by the sounds of it, if the client does the best job that they can writing it and then sending it to you. Yeah. Or, or even hired me as a ghostwriter to interview them and understand them mm. because I don't think any of us want to buy a, a book 
from someone who we trust and then get filler content. You know, I think there is a responsibility that people have out there to do the work. And so I think that just coming from my background with how hard I've worked, I don't um, poo-poo anyone who uses the tools, but I think you have to be involved in the process if it's your thought leadership, if it's like a Mm -hmm. blog about cooking, whatever. But if it's, if you're staking your reputation on that sort of content and teaching, then I think there will eventually be moral and ethical guidelines around this stuff, or at least social expectations around these tools. I'm shocked at some of the media sites, to be honest with you, that have been using AI and they've just been pumping out this crap and they're surprised when they get caught. And it's how can you do that and be in an integrity? Yeah, I mean, I with journalistic integrity, I honestly don't know. I think it started when SEO became so into the thing and every news article was just chock full of keywords and right. and content. And then now I think it's it's the AI content. So it, it's interesting to, to watch what happens, but I will say that I don't have that pit in my stomach anymore because I'm just trying to find a place for myself in it all. And something tells Um, me as as AI continues to evolve and change, you're going to do the same with your offerings. Yeah. And I think this is the first wave and things will settle. And then now I have clients come to me wanting to hire me for a monthly writing retainer. And they're like, I don't care if you use AI as long as the product is good. So then I can even supplement with AI if I want to, but knowing that I still run it through my checkers and I still put my stamp of approval on it. So now I think it's, it's there to augment and not replace. I was going to ask you that. Do you use AI and what do you use it for? I'll use AI. I'll certainly use AI for content planning sort of thing. Like if I need to come up with a bunch of blog topics, I might see what AI has to say. I might um, frame or outline with AI. I am still quite against using AI for, like I said, any sort of personal thought leadership content. Anything that replaces the job I still have to do to understand the client, okay. the thinking part. So yes. if I I don't believe in going into chat GPT and saying like, write me a website for a tech leader and make it personalized because then that just cuts out wh- me getting to know the client and then I can't even edit it because I didn't put in that time. So for me using AI, I always to let the customer know. I have customers that don't care. And like I I did a website project for a guy. I didn't use AI. I wrote all 300 product descriptions or something crazy like that for him. And he just wanted to see more options for the content. He's like, yeah, just I want a lot of options to choose from. I don't care if you use AI. I don't care. So in that case, I'll I'll use it if the client's like, yeah, go for it. And I'll just make sure that I'm putting my editor hat on while I'm using it. Mm-hmm. So Gabby, what are your earnings looking like now? I would say that the overall, my business, the agency brings in anywhere between 20 and 30K per month. So that's kind of our our monthly. I obviously have contractors to pay, but I'm, yes. I'm usually in the five figure months. I go by months instead of years because obviously with this world, it's it's up and down with the economy. Yeah. But I would say that that my first business milestone a few years ago was those five k months of like if I can hit those five k months, I'll quit my job. And then I'll be good. And then it became sustained 10k months, and then it became sustained uh, 15k months. So that's probably the average, of course, plus or minus sometimes. Sure. Yeah, that's where we're at. And then luckily, we don't have too much overhead. And it's not like we burn cash. We don't advertise. We don't market. I'm thinking about maybe bringing on a salesperson eventually. But yeah, we really don't have high costs other than just paying contractors. And when I contract out the work, the graphic work and the web work, I still make a commission. So it's been kind of cool to even create passive income for myself, where if there's a month I don't really feel like working or I can't work, then I I have that structure built in and it won't all collapse. So great. And you still are the point person for the client, right? Yeah, I'm I'm always I'm always there. I'm always involved. Yeah. And is that uh, split between Fiverr and your own agency that you're advertising on the website? Yeah. I still, Fiverr is um, the main driver of the business, but I have an agency outside of Fiverr that gets referrals. And I have a lot of people come through my LinkedIn and as well as just my own circle. So I'd say that 
Fiverr is great for people who kind of need just like a one-off project. But I have a lot of referral clients that come to me wanting long-term support with their business that right. usually come through the agency. Yeah. And what's the name of your company? It's called Incubix Branding. And where did you come up with that name? I combined the word incubator and matrix into Incubix because it was like, this is where brands and their stories are born. So that became the name. And I was so surprised that it was just available. There's really not other businesses out there called Incubix. Perfect. Uh, yeah, that's the name of the agency. <laughs> and then in, in the last few months, I've started just my own website as well, because I've realized I have a lot more kind of higher demand retainer requirements for certain companies that now know me where I have to. There comes a point where you hit a ceiling and you can only take on so many clients. So there are some people who want one-on-one -on -one time with me. They want they definitely want me writing it. They don't want me contracting it out. They right. don't want me using AI. And I'm always honest with them about what I do. So that will obviously be like a premium, especially if I need to get to know your company. So that I've sort of started that away as a separate brand because one day I would really love to like do more of this kind of thing, teach people, help people actually become freelancers or become business owners and sort of pivot in that way, just so I have different things that I, yeah. I love to do. And then helping people is something I'm passionate about. And a lot of people are in the position that I was a few years ago. So I would love to potentially either do a course or, or do some coaching around that. Great. So you basically got three platforms now then you're working off of Fiverr and then your own branding agency. It, yeah. It's more than that. It's all encompassing. And then the personal aspect of what you do. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. I guess because of what you're doing, it's 100% remote. You can be doing it anywhere that you've got a good internet connection, right? So I, I'm on this tiny little island in the Gulf of Thailand. That's where I spend half the year pretty much. And I'm building a home here. And I'd say the only problem is sometimes the time zone with US clients. So it's just if you can wake up early or stay up late, it's just about making it work. And the life here is so beautiful and peaceful that it's worth sometimes a late night or an early morning. In the US, when I had first started my company, I felt so alone because all of my friends were like going into an office or they'd come home exhausted and we just didn't match really and actually sure. living a living abroad and meeting other digital nomads you talk about so much more than just like the weather how was your day what kind of party are we going to this weekend <laughs> because everyone is building something everyone is doing something and i was actually shocked by just how many people are doing it and how how much you can learn from them and even collaborate with them so living around the world has been huge for even just expanding my mind and introduce me to like what other people are doing, how other people make their mm -hmm. side hustles and sure. scale their scale their income. And compare notes and learn from one another. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So it's it's huge. I, I think I'd recommend travel to anyone who just wants to freelance, wants to work remotely or or has a, any sort of side hustle. Awesome. So what's the best way for our listeners to connect with you, Gabrielle? Yeah, absolutely. So if you want to connect with me, you can go to gabriellegerbis.com. That's probably the easiest thing to remember. It's just my name.com. Okay. You could also go to incubixbranding.com and through either of those websites, you'll find the social media handles if you would like to follow. So I love to share my life on Instagram. I love to connect with people on Instagram, especially. And uh, I talk about business a lot on there. Perfect. And I'll make sure that those links are in the show notes. Sounds great. Thank you. So what's your best tip, Gabrielle, to inspire others to start or grow their side hustle dream? Yeah, I would say I have two final notes. One is just to start. I think that's that's the big thing is that researching, planning, those things don't count as starting. They're great for research, but until you just dive in, it's kind of like a fighter, a boxer. If they're not in the ring, they they can only train so much for it. And They'll never know unless they they do the actual fight. So I would mm -hmm. say just begin. Consider the consequences of inaction is one of my favorite lines of what, what happens in five, 10 years if you didn't do it. So ju just do it. You only have one life. And then if you don't know where to begin, I would say rather than try to just Google like how to make a bunch of money <laughs> <laughs> or how to get rich overnight is just to consider your skills. 
I think everyone has a skill that they can monetize in some way, shape or form that could lead to other things. So if you're a strong writer, if you're a project manager, even if it's something you've learned in your corporate life or just something you're passionate about, there are a million ways to make money on the internet, but it has to be you. It has to be authentic. Just consider your skills because nobody else brings that exact combination of skills to the table. I couldn't agree more. Well, thank you so much, Gabrielle, for sharing your experience and not just surviving, but uh, thriving in the midst of AI and uh, your you. story for carving out life as a successful digital nomad. And of course, for being today's side hustle hero. Thank you so much. It was amazing to talk about this and I really enjoyed our conversation. I wanna pick up on something that Gabrielle said in her closing remarks. She said, consider the consequences of inaction. What's your life gonna look like five to 10 years from now if you don't act today? To help entice you to take action, try this exercise. I call it the rocking chair test. Imagine it's the day of your 90th birthday and you've just wrapped up an awesome party. Your friends and family have gone home and you find yourself in your favorite rocking chair. You're looking back on your life and you see in your mind's eye all the wonderful things that have taken place and you feel a deep sense of gratitude. Now in this moment, consider what things that would be absolutely unthinkable for you to have not tried. You've likely heard me say that I would much rather try something and have it not work out than play that what if game down the road. What if I had started that side hustle? What if I had the courage to say yes, to accept that invitation or opportunity? You get the idea. Don't play the what if game. Be brave, start it, try it. Every successful achiever I know will tell you that the learning experience they gain from taking a leap of faith often proved invaluable for future achievements. Do the rocking chair test to identify what you need to start doing today to be able to look back at a wonderful, fulfilling life well lived. Well, that's a wrap for today. You'll find links to the websites we mentioned and Gabrielle's contact info at our website, sidehustlehero.com. If you enjoyed this episode, let me know you're listening and tell me how this podcast is helping you. And what areas could we do better? You can tag me or send a DM on Instagram at Joan Possibly. Thanks for listening and hustle on.